I'll go ahead and get us live here. All right. Okay, we are live. Good afternoon or good evening, depending on your location. What a wonderful treat this is. Stuart O'Neill, gentleman in the glasses. Michael Carita, beloved of the poison pen. I'm going to mention him first because we have such a long association together. Author of Private Eye novels, thrillers, S. Scott Carson, Supernatural, has a movie. I mean, he's a kid. I will always think of him as a kid because he was like 21 or something when we first got together. I could have been his grandmother. Well, I was, in fact, older than his grandmother then, and I'm still older than his grandmother. But anyway, no one knows that. We've had many, many happy years together. This is uh, apparently our first date with Stuart O'Neill, who I just learned has an unhappy history in Phoenix, but we're about to correct that. And um, and I'm going to turn this over to Patrick Milliken, who's a longtime fanboy of both authors, and we're going to have a good time. I will mention to you that Stuart kindly autographed our book, Ocean State, but we have sold out of all our signed copies, which doesn't mean that it won't read just as well and be just as good a book, but we can't offer you a signed one. And my only other comment is that I find it really interesting that in April, if you know crime fiction, you'll know there are like four books set in Rhode Island up until this <laughs> April. And now we have Stuart and we have Don Winslow, which I find really interesting. It's like a little mini cluster of Rhode Island. I just um, finished Don's. Um, Don's new one. You mean the one we sent you? Yes. I that very book? How excellent. Right. So, Stuart, now you know one of the reasons that authors work with us is we surreptitiously. If you need galleys, oh, that's the only reason. People. <laughs> the only reason that I write is to get free books. That's it. It's a really good thing. So, in contrast to most of our events, I'm about to go dark, and Patrick is going to host this because um, he wants to. Well, as I said, he's a fanboy. So, what fun. Anyway, yeah. guys, have a good time, and I'll lurk. Thanks. Lurk Thank away. You, Barbara. Well, you know, as, as Barbara said, you know, big fan of both of your of your work and, uh, you know, been been reading Stuart since close to the very beginning. I think Snow Angels was the first one I read. And of course, Michael from the very beginning. Um, uh, but it's just real a real treat to, and an honor to have both of you guys here today. Uh, so thanks for joining us. And um, I'm going to let Michael do the heavy lifting here uh, for the program, but I might sneak in with some uh, some questions. And those of you watching on YouTube and Facebook, um, please feel free to put in any questions you might have for, for both of these authors, and I'll be happy to, to ask them. So, uh, Michael, let's turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Um, this is, it, it is an authentic honor. I, Stuart is a friend and um, probably let me have this opportunity because he's a friend, but I also think Stuart Onan is legitimately one of the greatest writers we have alive. And that's not hyperbole. I think he's that good. So it's a, it's a privilege for me. Stuart, thank you very much for, for the opportunity. And with that, I'll, I'll try to shut up and just let you talk so we can, uh, you know, hear your thoughts about your book. Um, and first things first, I want to talk about the narrator. And um, if you could explain a little bit about why you chose to tell this one through Marie's eyes, because it's a story that on its surface, it would seem to belong to some other characters. And, and you might have been able to go with um, just a third person or you, why that first person voice? Why that retrospective narrator? Well, and, and this takes all the way back to the origin of the book, which is based on a murder that happened in a small river town in Connecticut. Um, in Haddam, Connecticut. Uh, there was this young girl named uh, Marianne Measles who was 13 years old and she had just moved to town, broken family, kind of, kind of a tough life and she needed to find a way in uh, to the social scene there. And so she decided the way in was to sleep with the boys in this clique that she wanted to join. And the girlfriends of the boys in the clique did not like that. And so they convinced the boys to get rid of her. Uh, and to kill her. And uh, I think there was four of them together that killed her and stuffed her in an oil drum and then dumped her into the Connecticut River. This is back in the 1990s and it kind of just stuck with me. I, I knew I always wanted to write about it, but I couldn't quite find my way in. I was, I was focused so much on Marianne herself um, and then on Marianne's family. And just started to think about the people that cared the most about her. Um, 
which is a tactic I, I, I typically use with point of view narration. Who cares the most about what's happened uh, or what's happening right now live in the scene? Um, and I started thinking about Marianne's mother and Marianne's sister. And as I started just brooding over that, and this took months and months and months. I mean, it, it's that, that slow process of catching on to something. And I realized I wanted to write from the point of view of a younger sister. But what I didn't know until I started actually writing was it was the sister of the killer rather than the victim. And so that's a whole, okay. different, it's a that's whole a different set of Very problems. different story, yes. Anyway, different story and, and, and sort of opened up a lot of doors and made, made a lot of, suddenly a lot of questions popped up. And I was like, wow, I've got a lot to think about here. Um, and so I wanted to come up with the relationship between the two of them. And I started to think about Marie and Angel and the, the age difference between them and Marie kind of idolizing Angel. And Angel is her role model for everything. She's beautiful. She's athletic. She's confident. Everybody loves her. She's, she's popular. Everything that Marie is not and that Marie may never be. Uh, but so she aspires to being Angel. Um, and I started thinking about that relationship between the two sisters and the way the position of the family within that very small New England town. And the book that came to mind, I mean, it was one of my very favorites, Shirley Jackson. Oh, We've sure. always lived in the castle. Uh, and the narrator who carries this story is Mary Cass, um, the younger sister of an exemplary older sister who has been accused of murder. And so I started to think about how that might generate some, some interest and some warmth and also that split, the contrast between this tiny little world inside their house and the larger world of the town and the legal machinations that happen later. Um, so I came up with the first line of the book and the first line of the book for, for months and months was, that summer we lived in a house by the river. And it's, it's kind of a gloss on Hemingway, A Farewell to Arms, if you remember. Yeah. That's, it's that cadence. Not, so, not where you ended up then. So how do we no, get to not, the... Not at all. But, but I, I needed that relationship between the two sisters to be the, the, the warmth, to be the intimacy, to be the spark, to be that idea of what is going to be lost, right? You have to make present what's going to be lost. And so I need to make present and make very sort of prominent and palpable their relationship. So I started just working on them, the two sisters, and that was my way into the book. So I knew it was going to be a first person, it's Marie, for warmth, because something that's going to happen, and, and it's going to be, be a very cold book, I think. So I want yeah, to it's, be a, it's a cold open. You're, you're laying yeah. it right out there. Here is This yeah. is a cold crime from, um, not cold people, but she she brings, it's, the, it's just reversing that emotional dynamic. And she also, she tells us, I felt like there was a little bit of, of Nick Carraway to her. And maybe that's <laughs> just because you and I have talked so much about, you know, Fitz and you've written a beautiful book, West of Sunset, um, about Fitzgerald. But she brings a little bit of that element where she, she tells us she's invisible. You know, she wants to say, hey, this isn't about me early on, but of course it really is. And I was curious if, if Gatsby was on your mind at all, or if that was, you know, the farthest thing from what you were thinking about with her? Um, a little far, but yeah, I mean, and Nick being, you know, the carrier of that story, I mean, he's definitely going to come to mind, but I was thinking more of, you know, it's my favorite book. So, so long, long to see you tomorrow. William Maxwell, one of our great, great writers of all time. Um, and I used this chassis before in Snow Angels. Um, and I was like, oh, am I just repeating myself? Am I doing the same sort of thing again? There's a little bit of that there, I think. Um, I knew I wanted to go I, retro. I, I don't want to interrupt you, but um, I have to laugh at hearing, of, of all the writers I can think of, hearing Stuart Onan say, am I repeating myself, is, is very unique. And it makes me, it actually, that pleases me. The idea <laughs> that you fear that um, is, is deeply reassuring because I feel like, to the average audience member, you write in such bold and varied directions and you sort of throw down this gauntlet for yourself and you say, I, I will not you know, tread on this ground again. And I can see the Snow Angels elements of it, but um, it's, it's good to know that you actually fear that. And now I, I, I cut you off, but please go ahead and make your point there. I, I, I did worry about that a little bit and using that, that first person to warm up what's going to be a very chilly and chilling story. Um, but I thought it was the correct way to go and I needed that way in. 
And again, I'd been sort of brooding over this material for so long that I knew there was something in it, something there to find. And what I found once I got into it, I think was very different than what I found in Snow Angels, uh, which is much more about the obligations of parental love, uh, where this yeah. is more about sort of the, the, the ecstasy and misery and, and wildness of romantic love and, and what the need for that can do to us, which I think is at the heart of the original murder case and the murder that happens here, that need for love and that feeling that we will not be loved, that we will never be loved or we'll never be loved again like that. And then that possessiveness that takes over and says, I can't lose this person. I will do anything, anything to keep them. Um, so you, I, I, you, you bring to the table there. Sorry. Do you mind if I just jump in for a second? Would you mind holding up that Maxwell book again? <laughs> You know, I have huge holes in my reading, and I'd love to. So long, see you tomorrow. Long, see you tomorrow. So Don't long, see you it. tomorrow. This is 1980, uh, 135 pages long, and Perfect. yet it is it is powerful and and big and in many many ways. Um, and and again, back to that idea of why the first person, why Marie starts out there. I knew I wanted it to be a retrospective book. And a retrospective book in which the first person has this story that they've had to carry their whole lives. And they don't, like Nick, they don't quite know what to make of it. Like the William Maxwell figure in So Long, See Tomorrow. Um, they have to put it out in front of the reader and say, help me understand this. Because this has changed my life and I don't quite understand everything about it. Um, so I, I knew I needed Marie for that. And then as I got further into it, I realized it really was about... Um, how, how we see ourselves and what is our personal worth and you know are we worth anything if nobody loves us and what will we do to, to be recognized to, to be understood to be known there and Marie something, feels that she's never I, been something I think you do so well in this is you talked about a moment ago you were talking about passion and possession but you you never for a moment um write down to the idea of love, romantic love, as an authentic emotional driver for teens. And I think that is so often a temptation. It's to say, oh, you know, th here's the thing they don't understand. And I love that you just, when you're 16, when you are deeply in love and you're 16, 17 years old, it is the most acute emotion. And the idea that it will drive you, change you, make you crazy is, it's always there. And then I think we get distance and there's a, a tendency to sort of look, look at that um, teenage prism and say, well, here's what they didn't understand. And you didn't write from within that place at all. So if you could talk a little bit about how you capture teenage girls are scary from a voice standpoint, even if you are a teenage girl, you are not. So how did you get there? A great question. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not quite sure how I, I, I... I fell into it. Um, Marie, especially as a character, I mean, she is the baseline there. She's, she's kind of where I started. And I don't know. I mean, how do you write about any character that's not yourself? Um, Fitzgerald said, all I need is an emotion that I understand. And the emotions that, that Marie is going through, I understand very, very well. Um, and, and so I, I see her as, I mean, Madame Bovary, c'est moi, right? I mean, everybody in the story is me in some sense. And I just have to try to put myself into them and see what they're going through and how would, you know, you're just thinking about, you're, you're thinking about these characters for months and, you know, for, for years at a time and, and you come to know them better than you know yourself or that you know the people around you because you, you try to give yourself sort of total access to them. Um, so that sounds know. conceptually uh, accurate. It's one of those things yeah. that it, it's, Okay, this is this is how you approach a character. You get inside their skin, you see the world from within their lives, but it doesn't, to me, answer the nuts and bolts of voice, the actual way that they need to talk and interact with one another. You yeah. know, how well, how are you getting there? Part of that is, I mean, part of that is is just your sense of voice on the page what the words on the page are telling you and the voices in your head are telling you. And part of it is also doing research. Um, I was lucky enough in, in this particular book uh, to find a yearbook from Westerly High School 2009 that had been owned by wow. 
young woman, the age of angel. And in it, of course, were all the you know, inscriptions from her friends. Um, so I could go through that and find out what was on their minds and how they talk with one another and you know what were the big movies that year and what were they so that 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 mise en scène there is filled with detail and the question is what do you choose you know and being selective with detail is something that I'm usually pretty good at I think that partly comes from me being an engineer uh, having parsed a mm -hmm. fuckload of data. Um, you know, I, I, I typically bring in as much material as I can and go through it and look for the stuff that what has been used, what's done to death, what what don't we need, um, what's interesting, what tells us something about the characters, what is what has emotional resonance with the characters at the time. Which is one thing I, re I really, really love is, again, finding that character who cares the most about what is happening in this particular scene and then bringing that emotional urgency there. Um, and in this case, I have extra emotional urgency because we have two young women who are wildly in love. And we have Marie, who's kind of in despair in this sort of quiet, you know, tamped down despair and wants to disappear, even though she's already invisible. And then we have Carol, who has gone through some hard times and is trying to keep going and doing the best for everybody around her. So I have a lot of characters who are in these heightened states. Um, and it's kind of, I mean, you think about the it's frame. It's an emotionally it. fraught book from the jump. It's, it's, it's a melodrama. It's, it's a teenage love triangle that ends in murder in a small town. Um, so, I mean, cue the Dateline music. You know, it's, it's, it's very, I think, I want to say it's very, uh, how to say it. Um, I wanted to get the sense, the feeling of how it is to be desperately wildly in love and also desperately and wildly in love and then the person you're in love with betrays you and you lose everything and then you have to find a way to get it back and what do you do to get it back um that that love triangle there that breaks apart comes together and breaks apart and comes together yeah. that was the, sort of the heart of the book and that's really what i i found myself trying to make sure i got right um which was amazing um, and that leads into the idea of who is the muse for the book, Angel Olsen, um, the, the, the singer songwriter. The singer. Now, now she's, she's now, I guess, a rock star, um, but she's just an amazing songwriter and, and is so good with that kind of romantic love gone wrong. Um, she's so good at it. And so that was the soundtrack for me in, in thinking about the characters and, and thinking about the scenes and, and the feelings um, of these young women. Um, she kind of was my guide, my spirit guide through it there. Do you um, so generally I, have a soundtrack for a book or was this oh, a, a more unique experience? Okay, so you always no, have. I always have a soundtrack for the book. Usually it's attached to the characters somehow, but this seemed to be more overarching, I think, and really set the mood for the entire book. Um, does it ever drive things? You mentioned how long this story had been, you'd been sitting with it, but you hadn't found your way in. Did the... Did the music help get you there early or? Oh, it accelerated, definitely accelerated things to understand where exactly, especially Birdie, where Birdie's coming from. Sure. Um, because Birdie has uh, nothing to gain, everything to lose uh, by what she's doing, but she can't help herself. She simply cannot help herself. She has fallen hard for this boy who is just a boy. You know, he, he plays guitar, he has long hair, he drives a nice car, he's got some money, there's a house on the beach, but he's, just, the beach house. Right. he's just a boy. He, he could be any boy. And, and he treats both of them like a teenage boy would treat girls. He's nothing terribly special, but to her, he is everything. And to, to, to hear from him, again, from him again, to get like a text message from him, it's a huge thing. It's a gigantic thing. All the him. circuits light up then. Yes. Oh my God. And, 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 and judgment death. is gone. It, the circuits yeah. laid up and judgment is crushed. Yeah. And, and, and to be with him and, and to, for them to be together alone and to, to, to the sense that they could actually end up together, you know, that's, that's everything to her. Um, and and of, of course, you know, it's the, it's the Joyce Carol Oates line that I always quote, which Joyce Carol Oates never wrote, but it was, I was in love with two men. So one of them had to die. <laughs> which I, I always use that in my writing classes and I keep looking for it. I don't think she ever really wrote the story. I think I just made it up. So. Oh, are that's great. Both, are you guys both fans of um, uh, James Salter? Have you ever oh, of course. the sport? Oh, yeah. I was thinking about sport in the pastime with what uh, Michael was bringing up. Some of those, the intensity 
of those young relationships. Yeah, he did that so well. Yeah, but there's that weird voyeuristic thing in, in sport in the past time where we know it's the author making up these sexy scenes involving these other people. So yeah. it's a little creepy. <laughs> yeah, you can you feel the <laughs> voyeurism is the right word there, I think. But Absolutely. but there's also that 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 great what's the word for it? That risk of you know a 60-year-old person writing about teenage girls in love. I mean, it, it's a huge yeah. leap. Um, Tom Wolfe tried to do it in I Am Charlotte Simmons um, and, and just, just crashed and burned in a huge way. Um, so that was the cautionary tale. It's like, man, if you're going to try this, you better get it right. Um, so again, I, I, you know me, I run my drafts by a lot of people, um, including you, who helped in a huge, huge way and brought a lot more warmth to at least one character's storyline. Um, but you know, you got to be willing to take that risk and, and to, to, to risk falling on your face sometimes to get the really good stuff that you kind of had the feeling that it's there. Um, and if you're lucky, especially in the second half of the book, you start finding all the stuff that you, you hadn't expected when you walked into the situation. Right. Um, you, you follow it logically. You follow what would these characters really do in this situation? And they take you to places that you're like, oh, this is really what I'm writing about. You got into the dynamic of a prison family for a little bit too. And I was wondering, I, was that anticipated or was that one of those gems that you get later on? You say, oh, this is where the scenario has led me. But if I really dig in here, there's some special stuff. Yeah, and, and, and this goes back to, you know, following characters and being realistic and, and letting, as Dennis Lehane, our friend says, let the bad thing happen. But yeah. what happens after the bad thing happens? then there are consequences. So follow those consequences because those are bad things that continue to happen, right? I mean, for Angel, certainly, for Birdie, certainly, um, for everybody. So I looked at, let's see if I got it here, um, Rose Ellen Brown in Before and After. It's a really, really lovely I have not read this. Um, I love your product placement, by the way. This is... <laughs> Well, I, I'm trying to explain you know, how I came to do these things and why before and after is the story of like uh, saving Jacob or defending Jacob. That was a TV movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. William I. Day. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's this family that the mother and the father and their son is accused of murder and the mother and the father have very different ways of how they want to approach this, this problem of their son being mm -hmm. accused of murder. And so they going through the entire legal system. They're always sort of, you know, at loggerheads with each other. Um, so I wanted to throw some of that in there too. And how do you deal with that when you don't have the means to deal with the legal system? Because in before and after, these are very comfortable people. These are very sort of upper-class people there. In my story, Carol barely has money to get to the next month. Um, and suddenly she has to somehow defend her daughter and to try to save her daughter. Um, she has to step up in some way and she'll do as we do in love. She does anything to make that happen. Um, I, mean, I don't know if, there's, if she has any regrets about that either. I think she, she loves her daughter so much that she'll do whatever she has to to do it. Um, and she does, she steps up. One emotion that I feel like you, you seem to be drawn back to, whether it's um, Songs for the Missing or Ocean State or Emily Alone, honestly, it's this quality of enduring in the face of absence. Usually when we've lost someone in the most literal way after a death, but in, the, in Ocean State, we have that it's, it's an absence where a character has been removed. And there, there are many layers to that. Is that something you're, you're consciously seeking out or is that just emotional terrain that you find yourself you know, back in the spot? I do find myself back in the spot. I mean, and we think of Speed Queen. I mean, Speed Queen is a prison narrative. Sure. That's where it comes from there. Um, and there, there's sections in um, Snow Angels also that, that run into you know, what is going to be a legal system problem there. Um, so yeah, um, we've got Speed Queen, we've got uh, The Good Wife, uh, and now we have Ocean State, all with prisons, all with women in prison. Um, I don't know, I don't know why I, I, I end up there, but and I knew I had to follow beyond that point of the murder. Um, and the first line of the book, uh, when I was in eighth grade, my sister helped kill another girl. That's the promise to the reader that we are going to get to that point of the murder. 
but I know I also, I, I've seen a few reviews um, that, that talk about the the book, and it is a bold choice. Opening with a line that tells the reader what happened. You know, you're you're, you're giving the crime story away, and and it is, it's it's a obviously a bold choice. But I also think they're missing out on a very key word there, which is helped, because there's a question still. It's it's the promise is there, but there's still the thing that makes us lean forward that we don't know yet beyond the how, why, and when. It's well, who I, else is the how, the how, and the why are you know just as important as the who. I think yes. we, we don't watch we don't watch Dateline to find out that the husband did it. We know the fucking husband did it. We know yes. he did it. We want to find out how he did it and how he was able to do this and go on with his life somehow. Um, and how, say, the sister was able to somehow go on with her life. And then what happened? But they rarely show all those consequences far beyond this. Um, so because usually you said, as you mentioned with Dennis's line, you know, let the bad thing happen. As an audience, as a news consuming audience, uh, the bad thing happens and our attention shifts elsewhere. And we very, you know, there might be the 20 year retrospective piece, but it tends to be an anniversary, just super, you know, cursory overview. And we move on from bad thing to bad thing. And I, I love the, the way you make us hold the lens and consider these lives lived around, a, you know, a crime that rocks the community is the, the newspaper cliche and you're actually pushing us into the community. And that's something I wanted to bring up. You, you and I both have a tendency that I think is interesting. We, we live in our hometown we like our hometown and we're always writing about people who want desperately to escape their hometowns. <laughs> so <laughs> what is it about that, you know, that narrative that speaks to you, that appeals? Well, I mean, in, in this case, I've got my, my four point of view narrators. Um, they're, they all have a, a different take on that town. Um, Marie, yeah. of course, ends up in that same town. Uh, but mother, she's not a spinster though. She's not, or a witch. Um, and, you know, um, Angel wants to get out of her situation, I think. And she realizes they don't have the means. They just don't have the money to get out of their situation. Miles and his family have money. He's going to go away to college out of state somewhere. She is going to lose him. She's going to lose any entree that she had into that sort of high end life with the beach house and all that. So the, the contrast between their two lifestyles and where their lives are headed is so huge. And that's another reason why she's pushed to do what she does. Um, the mother, I think she would also like to leave this town. The grandmother has never thought of leaving this town. I mean, she met her grand, her, her husband in the mill right across the road from where they live. So she loves the mill as a, as a symbol, as a, I mean, we know those towns, it's a, it's a great visual angle, but it also, um, in, in the most literal way, it, it looms as a sense of legacy of the, the, the big, the community and the individual. And I just, I think you did that beautifully. And the, the wreckage that is left and that you have to somehow deal with and, and abide with. And I think that's what ends up happening with Marie there. And who, who is stuck with this? Who has to carry this? And that's why Marie makes sense to go through the book and we say, where does this story begin and where does this story end? And the story definitely right. doesn't end with the murder. Um, the story ends years and years later. So that's why I needed that retrospective narrator there and one who misses everything and one who can't let go of everything. Um, she, she, she holds on to that season the way that Arthur holds on to that season in the Snow Angels, uh, but for different reasons. Can I jump in just for a second? I just wanted to well, I mean follow up on something Michael was saying, which was, um, you know, when they have like these you know, notorious true crime cases, you know, these personal tragedies. Um, I always find it interesting how they, and they re-explore it, like say in 10 years after the original case, and then in 20 years after the original case, and they interview the family members, and you really get the sense of the weight that the family has carried, you know, over time in some of these, some of these stories. And I, I think that's a really interesting point. And it's, it's inescapable. And I think, I looked at it a little bit in Songs from the Missing, where Lindsay, uh, the younger sister, again, um, has to somehow separate herself from the legacy of her, her sister Kim um, being abducted and murdered. And she does it 
because she's strong. She does it because she has to, but it's a terrible, awful choice uh, where she loses. She has to become this other person completely. Um, and she does. Um, that, in, in that book, that was the, the surprising thing for me that Lindsay became the person that carries the story forward by getting rid of it, by erasing it, uh, and by erasing basically herself within her family, um, which is horrible. It's, it's a terrible thing, I think. Um, talk about a horror novel. Um, but yeah. Did you ever consider a version of this where the characters would think that they might get away with it? But there's sort of a doomed acceptance to once the crime has occurred, no one, and I loved it, it rang very true. It was, it felt authentic, but no one really feels like they're making a break and escaping. And usually in this type of, of so many crime stories, we have at least one character who thinks I can pull it off. And I don't <laughs> feel like you have that. No, no, definitely not. I definitely not. And I think, I think, from the moment it happens, I think Angel realizes that it was a mistake um, and that she's destroyed everything. She's, she's somehow won miles back. Um, and so she can pretend after the killing that he is hers again, but it's almost like a, a it's almost like she's play acting. It's almost like this, this romantic, you know, this romantic vision that she's had, you know, the, the meetings that the two of them have there in the graveyard by the pond and, and the right. notes that they send to each other. It's almost kind of play acting. And they realize that, you know, once, once they actually are taken into custody for good, that, that they're probably never going to see each other again. Um, so there is something teenage romantic. They, they nurse this flame, this fiction for as long as possible, but it gets kind of a, too. There's a kind of narcissism there, I think, that, that Miles goes along with at that yes. point. And Miles is he's very pliable. He's very, very pliable. He's willing to just go along with whatever because he's totally interested in, in just material sensation um, and what feels good and, and what's, what's the word for it. Um, whatever strokes his ego is going to work with him. Did you ever consider writing from his point of view or did you try it? No, never, never. Definitely not. Definitely not. He is not the actor in this in this particular drama. Um, he is simply the prize between uh, the two young women there, and a prize that is is and many people have pointed this out not worthy. It's not worthy of those right. uh, either of those two, and yet those two exalt him to this this place where he becomes so important, and he becomes this what they have to fight over, and fight they will. Um, they they are very active. They make bad choices, but they're definitely their choices. They have agency. They're not passive whatsoever. I think Miles is much more of a passive character. And in that, I wanted to not have to go into him in terms of point of view, because you need your your even a narrator like Marie, who we think is a little bit passive, actually isn't. She makes choices no. and then has to examine. them. Um, whereas I don't think Miles does that. Um, he's just he's not that kind of a person. There's an authenticity to having, as you said, the unworthy prize, too, because we, ultimately we don't, or at least I don't, care. I just need to know what they want and why they want it. And there's something that is more lasting. This is a book, I've told you this, um, it is a book that lingered with me in a way that few things have in recent years. And I, I've wondered why honestly it's like okay i know he's an incredible writer and it's a story that i love but what is the the lasting quality of it and i think part of it is tied into that idea of the frustration we feel watching people fight for something that they should be smart enough to know know better than not just to do the thing but it's not even worth the fight well and william maxwell in talking it and he was talking about So Long Sinomar. He says, the reason life is so strange is that so many people have no choice. Wow, that's and, a great line. And, and in the situation that certainly Carol is in and that, that Marie is in and Bertie is in and Angel is in, they, they really have very, very few choices. And to them, these seem their best choices to be loved, to be known, um, and to be happy. And, and so even though they may have regrets about these choices, they would probably end up making them again. Um, 
just because how it made them feel. And again, it's it's, it's, it's those it's questions not, of identity that they feel like they're resolving. Uh, Right. I mean, and, and if the person that I love the most in the world and whose love I need the most says that I'm worthless and useless and doesn't want me anymore, what does that make me? And right. what do I do? How do I respond to this? Uh, I can respond with anger. I can respond with despair. Um, and, you know, in, in a very Lady Macbeth kind of way, Angel responds with anger um, and, and responds with a kind of strength, I think. She says, no, this is not going to happen. I'm going to fight for this worthless teenage boy um, because he's mine and that possessed- I love the way you used social media as a tool of escalation I oh. thought that rang really true to our moment but also to these characters where once it is made public in that forum it seems like this is we have crossed the Rubicon now and she well, has to respond the, the, the fishbowl that they're in one it's a very small town Two, they're in high school. And then three, you add in the social media on top of that. I mean, it's, I mean, every little thing is picked apart. And so there are even people that that don't even know who Birdie is, who are like calling her, you know, racial slurs on on social media. And she's like, you know, what the fuck am I going to do with this? You know, is this all worth it because I can be with Miles? And that's, you know, again, as you say, that accelerates everything and says, I just need to hold on to this good thing that I have. I need to hang on to this. This is all I have. I don't have anything else. Um, right. So it's, it's a book about desperation, but it's also, I think, a book about ecstasy. It's a book about, you know, love and young love. And, and, and like you said before, that, that passion um, and, and the way that passion and romantic love possesses us and exalts us um, and, and makes us happier than, you know, we could ever be at other times. Um, and, and of course, that passive is not a long-term thing. And, and Yeah, passion it, and good decisions are not necessarily holding hands as they walk off into the, and into especially, the future. Especially when, when you're young, but you know, I mean, say the murder doesn't happen, how would Bertie look back upon this time? Um, she may look back upon it fondly at moments um, and with sadness at moments, but with deep feeling, with deep, deep feeling. Yes. It's not, it's not th- something that's stupid. Um, it's something that is all encompassing and all involving. Um, and that's, that's really what I wanted to sort of write about, because um, I don't think I'd really written about that before, um, ever. And of course, then you've got the, 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 the mother, Carol, having to make these romantic choices based on economics, which she feels horrible about um, and, doesn't, and doesn't really want to do. And you can see that by her actions. By, she stays with Wes, even though she's, you know, she's supposed to be somehow loyal to Russ, but she can't do it. Right. She has the, that's the, the advantage of the years that is also very painful for her is, okay, I know it's, I know better than to follow my heart. I, she knows, she knows knows better than to follow her heart or to follow just her, her passion, but she Mm -hmm. can't, she, she, she can't stop herself from feeling that way. And again, when you can't stop yourself from feeling a certain way, you can't stop yourself from doing something, you know, that seemed to me really, really interesting. That kind of, that possession again. And that, and that was really fun to write. So it's, how long, how long had this book, uh, Stuart, been percolating in your, in your subconscious? Well, I mean, the, 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 the actual murder, I think took place probably in the late 1990s. Okay. But I were you living in that area at the time? You said it was Connecticut. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. So I, I'd read a ton about it, a ton about it. And I I tried to start it so many different times. And usually I tried to start it with the mother and um, moving to the new place or like the new kid in school kind of thing, you know, and they called her names, they got her name wrong or stuff like that. I just couldn't get it going. And then I tried to start with the group of teens that end up killing the girl. And, and there was an opening scene in which they're by the river where they hang out all summer by the river bend where they went swimming after their summer jobs and the Amtrak Northeast corridor, a cellar would come over a bridge as they're underneath there. And I, and I wrote that thing. I don't know how many times badly, um, never could get it to live. could never get it going in a way. Um, I mean, I can see it all, but I, I couldn't make it somehow move for the reader or, or, or grip the reader. How, when you when you say you tried that, how far did you get into the narrative? 
Oh, not far, because I, I try to do an opening scene. I try to run that opening scene and get it, actually get it going. You know, even even roughly, it just it just wouldn't. It's like it wouldn't turn. It's just could not catch at all. Um, even though I had this, I thought it was a great scene that said a lot about is this very. Um, what's his name? Jeffrey Crudson. Crudson, the the photographer. Um, he takes all these shots of. He takes lots of shots of um, suburban life and makes them look very sort of lurid and weird. Um, and the only reason you think of this scene as lurid and weird is because we know what happens, sort of in retrospect. Um, but it's right. sunny, beautiful, it's coastlines. Anyway, anyway. How did you get to Rhode Island? I, I know you have uh, a history there, but but why for this book? Why was it the right place for this? Well, I, I, was, I was fascinated by the river town, actually. I mean, doing one of those little Connecticut River, river bend towns that had used to be whaling ports way back in the day. I thought that was going to be really interesting and really fun to do. Um, but for some reason, I, I kept getting drawn down closer to the shore. I wanted to use the beach area. And I wanted to do that contrast between the people that live inland by these ruined mills and these little shitty mill towns and these million dollar homes right on the beach. Um, and I want, Miles has access to. Things. Right. It's, it's the world that Miles has access to. But it's also that, that beauty of the Rhode Island shore that I wanted to contrast with sort of the, the crappy, you know, going to Taco Bell for the Baja Blast kind of thing. You know, the, the differences and you know, the, the beauty of nature and then sort of the, the, the grinding everydayness of high school and Bertie's Facebook. got her job she has to return to. Oh, and... oh yeah. Bertie, Bertie works at the, the D'Angelo sub shop and um, Angel works at the CVS. CVS. Total unglamorous jobs. And then they see all these mass holes come down uh, any nice weekend and go and take over their beach. And there are you know, all the mansions along the road towards Watch Hill where Taylor Swift lives now. Um, so I wanted I to thought use- there was a very Mainer sensibility to it. And it's what you just <laughs> described. Only you said mass holes coming down. And um, <laughs> I, I was going to say we, I'm not a Mainer, but you know, it would be the mass holes coming up. But it's that same idea of here's the town. It's uh, I'm thinking of where Christine grew up, my wife, Here, you know, Biddeford and Old Orchard Beach. And there are the, oh, these oh. mill towns, but they're within you know, short drive proximity to Biddeford Pool and that level of sort of wealth and access. Did you say mass holes, Michael? That's fantastic. I did, yes. Yeah, I've never well, it's, <laughs> God, I mean, I, I, I've been, I've been that mass hole, you know, and I think I deep, deep inside, I think I have a mass hole within me. As a Red Sox fan, you must, yes. Yes, well, yeah, I, I lived in, in Boston for about seven years. Uh, my, my daughter is a lifer up there now. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of already in me. Um, but I, I wanted to see that other side of it, of, of living in that small resort town that, that gets taken over. You know, every summer gets taken over by the summer people, and the summer people still own a lot of that town, even in the off season. Right. And so even though it's quiet, there are all these places, you know, these mansions by the shore there that are, you know, they're just locked up. And the father, Frank, the, the ex-husband of Carol, one of his jobs is basically taking care of these mansions that are closed. So he goes in and he, you know, he does the leaves, he, he shovels the snow for people that aren't even there. Um, I love that. It's it, even when, even when they're gone, they still hold the key to the, to this thing. It's not, you don't get it back. It's not there. They're not handing it off. Right. It's right. always. That's when the squatters move in. Absence. <laughs> exactly. Again, I, that ties in also with, with Carol's job there and the, the, you know, relatively fancy retirement home. She doesn't make any money, but she's in there taking care of people that have money and have always had money. And right. she says, who's going to take care of me? You know, I don't have that kind of money. The girls don't want to do it. What's, what's going to happen to me? And so she's, she's in her, her whole life, she's lived in such close proximity to this wealth and this ease and this comfort, and she's never felt it. So when Russ takes her out suddenly to the casino up in Ledger and treats her, you know, like a like a queen she's it's like a you know, glimpse of this possibility is, you know, another I, yes. I, I, could, I could do this i could do this right they, they go upstairs and you know the, he gets the big suite with a jacuzzi and they're drinking you know wine in the hot tub she's like this is okay you know and, and i love the way that mirrored the, the scene with miles at the beach house too it's, yeah the champagne there it's a little, yes. little hitchcock there champagne means different things in different scenes to different people yeah so yeah, so I, just, I got a question for, for both of you guys, if you don't mind. Um, you know, you've been talking a little bit about, you know, some of these, um, 
you know, very writerly questions about, okay, finding, finding the right entry point into the book, the right point of view. And um, Stuart, I know and you probably don't teach anymore, I would assume, but I know you oh, I a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that comes up a lot with your, with your students about, okay, so do we write the book from Boo Radley's point of view and how would that work, you know? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, that's, that's uh, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird 2, uh, Boo's Revenge. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's a big book. Um, yeah, I mean- Amazon's just, working on it right now. They probably yeah. are. Yeah, I mean, choosing, choosing point of view solves so many problems and it gives you so many opportunities that you always have to say, you know, am I in the correct point of view here, you know? Um, have we seen this point of view being used too many times in this particular situation? What are you bringing that's new to it? Um, yeah, it's, it's always a question. And it's one of the first things that you have to nail down or I have to nail down probably within the first 50 to 75 uh, pages. Michael, how about you? Yes, I would agree with you. Although I, I would say I, I probably chase the wrong point of view more frequently for a longer time before I realize, no, this, this lens is not essential to the scene. Um, often, particularly in first draft, I'm pursuing, you know, I don't know what happens. So I'm pursuing this bigger story and it's not until I'm down into the weeds of revision that I remember it's all about the scene. You know, the story is scene to scene to scene. And did I need this lens for this scene? If not, that entire point of view character then becomes a different question to me. And those are usually the really frustrating days where, you know, you go out for a walk and it's like, ah, oh, shit. It's 125 pages I do not need. And maybe I need the events within those pages, but I'm going to have to write them from a different lens, a different perspective, because the, the character who matters most, the only essential character is the one that I left outside and they need to be inside. So it's it's always a, a struggle in that regard. And I, I would love to, it's been, um, it had been a long time since I wrote in first person or with just one point of view character. And I have to admit, writing Where They Wait, I was reminded of the positive side of the Lincoln Perry books. It was like, man, this thing just cooks along. And <laughs> it does. It's not that it makes it easier, but it removes some, one at least, of the endless questions. Um, I don't have to interrogate my manuscript about this. And, and that is kind of relaxing. And you don't have to jump out of one character's point of view and into another's and establish a difference between the two, right? And that, right. That, and my voice can be my voice, yes. Right, you can just kind of go default third subjective slash omniscient if you want to and but to me it's not just the unity of voice that makes things easy it's unity of time as well if you can get unity of time that container of, time, of the yes man man if you get that container and that natural clock and the reader feels they're headed towards something that destination then you've got it all but so many stories in life don't work that way like i mean west of sunset you can't say, oh, he's going to die here. So <laughs> he's yes. not how his life works, <laughs> you know, um, or uh, the good life, right? How long is he going to stay in prison? We all know, you know, there's, there's a baseline 25 to life. So how do you move time then becomes a huge problem. So even if sometimes you solve that point of view problem with unity of point of view, you still haven't solved everything about the book. Um, so there, there are always those choices. And usually you want to see those early on. Otherwise, you, you can spend a lot of time, you know, putting out a lot of pages that are just sort of going off places that have no real place within the story. Um, in this case, like it was, to, to circle back to Patrick's question that I think with regard to, uh, to teaching, I, I think what we have proven here is that it doesn't really get any easier there. I mean, we can talk about it and it, in retrospect, it's very easy for you to break down Ocean State and say, this decision was made on this day for this reason, and here's the payoff. But how many years were you at work on this? Yeah. In, in retrospect, it's very easy to say, this connected to that, the connected to that, the connected to that, and all came through together and it worked out. I mean, you exactly. have read you know, earlier drafts, know that 
the book didn't quite work as well as it works now. So Stuart, um, what, you're say, what you're saying is this is all your own retrospective testimony about your book. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it's kind of best case because so often in a book like this, I have no clue yeah. where I'm going or what I'm doing or what comes next. And you have to go by feel. Like that, that question of, you know, should I open with, after Marie's section, do I open in third person first? Why jump from first to third, which is a huge speed bump, right? But if I'm going to open in third, do I open with Birdie? Do I open with Angel, who we've just heard about? Um, do I open with Carol? Should I have gone with Miles there? Do I include Miles or not? Um, does the grandmother get a little section here or there? Um, so has either, all you, has either of you ever tried second person? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, is, is Stuart's uh, A Prayer for the Dying, I think, is it's the is clinic it's... on second person. Oh, boy. Well, that's a short one. That's a really, really short that's right. novel. That's the I, Civil War. Period. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's, the guy is the the uh, undertaker, the preacher, and the sheriff. And, and of course, the right. I forgot that was second person. Well, and it's, Michael, and it's Michael, a town that has both fire and plague. I loved right. this book. Yeah, I see. My, Michael just Michael loves a forest fire. You know, you know when things get quiet, throw, forest throw, forest a, throw a forest fire in there. You know, that's yeah. Particularly on the heels of a plague. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, second person there. I tried to write it in. Um, third it didn't work i tried to write it in first it didn't work um and i, I had seen uh robert o'connor's buffalo soldiers and how he right. used in there and he used it beautifully but he's using it against a character who's trying to do everything wrong and so that second person says oh you're screwing up and you notice you shouldn't be selling heroin in, in this army base you shouldn't be using the heroin yourself you shouldn't be going out with the teenage daughter of the commanding officer you shouldn't be doing this you shouldn't be doing that in this case i want to use it against the person that's trying to do the best for everyone in an impossible situation and so the second person breaks him down and it breaks him down like this hectoring voice like this you know you're doing everything wrong you, you and it's your fault they're dying because you screwed up and i was like wow that could make the reader want to protect the character from me, the author, which I think is kind of a neat situation to be in. Um, there was a, there's a slim, there aren't too many second person, maybe you guys can think of them, but uh, there was a slim novel by a Scottish writer named Ron Butlin called The Sound, hmm. of, the Sound of My Voice. Michael, do you know that one? No, I don't, but I'm it's, writing it down. Uh, it's, I think it's like 110 pages or something, but it's one of the best books about alcoholism. Wow. I've ever read. And the second person, it's, you know, our protagonist is trapped in the second person voice and it's a very claustrophobic. And that's a classic. It is a claustrophobic voice. Yeah. Yeah. That's the classic use of the voice, which we saw from um, Jay McInerney, Bright Lights, Big City, yeah. right? You shouldn't yeah. be doing all this cocaine. You know, Buffalo Soldiers, you shouldn't be doing all this heroin. You know, it does. Um, it has that inherent, you know, better. Daniel Woodrell. Didn't Daniel Woodrell, he started. I think it was tomato red with that, um, you know, you ain't no angel. You know how these yeah. things, you know how these things go down. And that was a great way to ease into his story. Yeah. And I know I've, I've been trying to, to keep my eye on the clock because I tend to do oh. a very bad job of this when I get into the weeds of talking, writing with, uh, with someone like Stuart. But I had two questions I wanted to make sure I got to in, reverse order of importance we're here at the poison pen so you know if you could mention a crime writer we should be reading that's one and then to celebrate your um your pub day the release i'm curious what whiskey you went to what was your whiskey of choice on the on the ides of march eh? um i think what i was drinking that night i i had a great day I had a great great day i mean everything was marvelous and the first question uh was megan Abbott. Megan Abbott is one of my favorite, favorite crime writers. And she was a champion of this book from the very beginning. And on my pub date, she recommended it to all of her Goodreads readers, uh, which was a, a huge, huge gift and really sort of buoyed my spirits there. Um, and I, I think I went for Russell's Reserve 13, the 13 year old um, that just came out last year there. And I think we killed off the bottle. Um, so it wasn't one you've been waiting to open then. No, I didn't crack anything new. I mean, I got so many open right now. I got to kind of get after them and attack them. Um, All right. Like that. Barbara's <laughs> back. 
I'm back. I've been I've been so pleased with this discussion as a listener. It was clearly the right yeah. choice to have Patrick be the host. Great hey, job, I, Patrick. I enjoyed listening too. I mean, it's it, and for everybody watching, what a what a wonderful uh, you know look under the hood, you know, for two writers talking with each other. It really Brings has been. I did a so. screenshot and posted it on Instagram while you were talking. And Stuart, I had to look up and make sure the Stuart O'Neill, which one was you? Or maybe they both are. <laughs> um, Instagram is tricky that way because sometimes you think you're, you know, you're marking a person. It turns out to be somebody, you know, in East Texas or something that has absolutely nothing to do with anything. But it's really, start, the start of a good crime story. Yep, oh, it's really been went. absolutely wonderful. Um, is there anything else that Michael you wanted to ask? No, I would just urge everyone to buy the book from their. Um, beloved independent bookseller and it's a great it's a hell of a read it's an, an incredible piece of work and an incredible body of work so cheers mr onan congratulations absolutely Thank you so much from a crime fiction standpoint mm. this is really an interesting book because you know from the beginning um what happened um or at least you know um that somebody was murdered and you know that's that's an interesting reversal of how so often crime novels are start out anyway. Um, so I thought that was great. The other thing I thought was really interesting, Stuart, and um, John Sanford's doing this in, in his book, Coming Up, The Investigators, which brings Letty Davenport, adopted daughter of Lucas Davenport to the fore, um, is, is showing us a, a section of America, you know, a, a blue collar or lower class that we don't necessarily see and illuminating what their life and what their what their aspirations what what hopes are dashed and what their grievances are um in a in a way that i think um is important for us to realize that might help us bridge the divide that seems to be growing every day um you know maybe maybe through literature maybe if there are fewer banned books because I don't even want to go into that whole topic at the moment. Um, but maybe I'm, I always think that people who read are are better placed to survive these kinds of political storms and um, disinformation and discussion than people who don't read. So um, I'm really delighted that your conversation today has probably promoted all that. So thank you for joining us. Um, Ocean State, don't miss it. Miss Arena. Barbara, before we before we sign up, I just wanted to ask the, the, the question to both Michael and Stuart, which is okay. what are you working on now? What's your next project? Uh, Michael or, or Scott, if Scott's here. Uh, it's Michael. I try to pick my identity. Michael is on an island off the coast of Maine and um, he has been stuck there for quite a while. I'm beginning to feel like, you know, Teddy Daniels in Shutter Island. I don't know how I ended up here. I don't know if I'll get off, but if I ever make it off the island, the book will be titled An Honest Man. Oh, and um, I'm, I'm hoping to deliver that shortly. Wonderful. Well, a great well, you, title. you can call Dennis if you can't figure it out. <laughs> I, I'll phone a friend happily at this point. I, I, I need that lifeline. Uh, I got nothing. I got nothing at all. No, I, I got to figure out what's next. That's always a difficult thing. I mean, what do I want the reader to actually see and care about? What, I mean, what haven't they seen? What, what, what do I think is important enough for them to spend you know, their hours thinking about? You know, Stuart, How that, many that, that is such a good point because it's not, it's not just the price of the book. It's the, it's the amount of time that you invest in a book that I think really determines whether it was worth it for you. Um, you know, um, too often we discuss cost or discounts and all that stuff, and that's really not the major factor. It's how many hours of our life can we devote to a story and what, whether that payoff is really important to us. Well, I mean, that. what am I gonna ask them to care about? Because that's yeah. what you're really asking, I think, in fiction. Ask people to care about this other person that otherwise they would never meet. All true. Great final question, Patrick. Thank you so much. Well, gentlemen, Stuart, I know you have another obligation, so we will let you go. Michael, always a delight. Um, thank you for thank your you. time. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Be well. Take care.